Hi, I'm Denis Gagné, CEO and CTO and Trizotech, and I want to welcome you to today's webinar. Uh, today's webinar is the second in a series of four webinars that we're doing on telemedicine. Um, you can find the previous recordings on the Trizotech website, and a future recordings will also be added there. So let me pass it on now to uh, John Zverbili. Hi. I'm John Sferbley. I'm the CMIO at Trisotech, and I'll be leading you through our discussion today, which is how to use telemedicine for improving patient care. Uh, first slide, please. So let's jump into the introduction. Uh, in our first webinar, we talked about improving efficiency uh, through the use of uh, telemedicine uh, uh, using models. Uh, one nice thing about uh, telemedicine is that uh, many of the uh, systems use protocols and the protocols are structured. So these are ideal for automation. Uh, the second uh, point we introduced was the uh, use of BPMN Health Open Standards, which uh, goes uh, from a protocol narrative to an executable model. And one nice thing about the BPMN Plus Health uh, tools is that they're readable both by humans and by uh, machines. And they're really designed for human subject experts to be um, uh, intimately involved in their development. The topic we used for the first session was on uh, teletriage of infants. And uh, one thing we like to do for each of our uh, talks is uh, show something that's useful. And in that uh, presentation, we talked about the use of attended tasks by uh, the human uh, clinician, which allows the clinician to edit both incoming data and output from models uh, to correlate with the uh, actual clinical situation, which means that they're not really a slave to a model, but they're actually in control. Uh, next slide, please. So our talking today is improving care. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, just talk a little bit more about telemedicine and where it's going. Uh, telemedicine took a big boost during the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Uh, once offices opened up again uh, during the summer, uh, there was a sharp drop off in use. Uh, so there's some questions about would telemedicine uh, usage persist? But there's many, uh, there's many indications that telemedicine is here to, uh, to stay and will increase. Uh, one of the big drivers for that are large companies that are getting heavily involved in uh, telemedicine, uh, such as Amazon, Walmart, and some other companies. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one feature about telemedicine uh, that we need to take into consideration when we talk about it is the uh, diversity that occurs. Uh, telemedicine has many flavors, and so you can classify each. One is you can classify it by function. So there's a function for managing chronic conditions. Uh, there's delivery of routine care. There's acute interventional care and others. Uh, you can classify it by specialty. So there's general practice, dermatology, surgery, uh, and whatever specialty uh, you desire. And then finally, you can uh, classify it by who is talking to whom. And this tends to follow the model that's seen in other uh, web-based applications where uh, you have a uh, provider provider is comparable to B2B, uh, patient to patient in a support group could be comparable to a C2C. Uh, so all these things have to be taken into account when uh, trying to consider uh, possible modeling of telemedicine. Uh, next slide, please. So today we're talking about home care for a vulnerable population. And when we look at vulnerable populations, these are just some of the patients that might be involved. One is home parental nutrition, and this will be our subject for uh, today's example. A patient who's followed uh, chemotherapy and who uh, usually uh, has defects in host defenses at that point. A heart failure patient with a history of frequent exacerbations, similar for COPD. And then a pediatric patient with multiple congenital anomalies or inherited metabolic disorders. All these are people who spend a lot of their time at home. In fact, the vast majority of their care is delivered at home. And since they're vulnerable, uh, uh, we have to have some mechanism of helping them uh, uh, in this period. Uh, next slide, please. So just for some uh, background, uh, I think uh, most people will say that in the future, healthcare will be provided in the home more and more. A uh, patient who's vulnerable at home is at risk for deterioration. Uh, one 
problem about being at home is out of sight, out of mind. So a person can start to deteriorate for some time before uh, they're brought to the attention of a healthcare provider. And the sooner a person is identified in the deterioration cycle, the better, because that means early intervention can reduce the chances that a person is going to go into a downward spiral. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, I think our tenets for today is uh, telemedicine uh, can be standalone. And indeed, I remember in the past uh, when you would go to a hospital, the telemedicine session uh, section would be a workstation which had a special computer and a special camera and a special uh, internet connection. Uh, so it was really not accessible uh, to patient care. Today with modern technology, uh, with smartphones and other aspects, uh, telemedicine is in your hands and is uh, has the potential to be integrated into overall care, just like uh, secure messaging has been incorporated into inpatient care. Then uh, device monitoring and other monitoring at home offers eyes and ears uh, to see how our patient is doing, which can allow for early problem detection. And that will really be the pro uh, focus for our talk today. Uh, next slide, please. So our goals today is demonstrate remote data monitoring uh, and how that can be used in conjunction with an early warning score uh, to detect uh, early deterioration and then how the act, uh, how this can be joined with telemedicine uh, to improve patient outcomes and avoid serious outcomes. And what we'd also like to do is introduce the uh, idea of a, a knowledge entity model or CHEM and how this can be integrated with workflow and decision models uh, to offer understanding and insights. Uh, next slide, please. Over to you, Denny. Thank you, John. Um, let me provide you a little bit of an introduction to uh, business process uh, modeling and what we call BPM Plus Health. BPM Plus Health is a community of practice that is open to everyone. Uh, it is established to foster the sharing and promotion of best practice around shareable pathways, uh, clinical pathways, and automatable clinical guidelines. And this group is open to everybody to join. So uh, we invite you to come and join this community of practice. You can find the URL at the bottom there of this slide. So when we're talking about the BPM Plus Health community and the BPM Plus Health set of standards, we're referring to a set of standards that are used for workflow automation and decision automation, where the workflow automation is really technology that enables the orchestration of activities and to react to the various events during that orchestration. And decision automation is really the technology to help make decision by returning a specific answer given some particular inputs. And both these type of technology can have human in the loop or not. We refer to these human normally in the context as knowledge worker that can be either contributing and interacting or completely uh, uh, be on the side. Our first uh, telemedicine webinar was touching on this notion of attended tasks and how they integrate. Now the set of standards, open standards that we use in this is a set of standards promoted by the OMG. We're using DMN, which is the decision model annotation, BPMN, the business process model annotation, and CMMN, the case management model annotation. All three uh, titles have this notion of model annotation in the name, and that's to specify the fact that not only these are models that a machine can read, they're also visual notation that a subject matter expert can easily understand and create. So DMN is really about supporting decision model by providing the decision logic and decision table to uh, achieve the decision. BPMN is really about prescribing the sequence of activities that should take place and react to event along the way. And CMMN is a case management environment where within a certain context, uh, we're reacting to the various events that may happen. And then this, uh, these reactions are based on what we call a declarative approach based on the event condition action type of semantic. 
Now, let me kind of cast these BPM plus standards within the bigger picture of already well-known healthcare standards such as FIRE and CDS hook. So at the far left, we have various different data sources that we want to aggregate. So we want this aggregated data from various EMR, uh, wearables, and different source of data. And we are using FIRE. So by adding FIRE to the mix, we're getting uh, what we call computable data. And the computable data uh, gives us uh, the capability of doing data automation uh, based on schemas that are common, uh, identity, resolution, and different factors. Then we can add CDS hook to the mix. And when we add CDS hook in the mix, we obtain data in a clinical context. And we know that data in a context is, is really uh, knowledge or information that we can treat. So this uh, information now becomes uh, the ground for us to do automation uh, information automation, excuse me, uh, based on metadata, context uh, that we have and the events that are occurring. Now, by adding BPM plus set of standards on top of this, we now use this actual information in a particular context. So we can do the orchestration of this knowledge and we do it by using workflow and decision automation. And this provides us with task and activities, role and responsibility, uh, decisioning, case management, event orchestration, and we can even throw AI and machine learning into this mix of orchestrated activity, which leads to a very intelligent healthcare automation environment. And that's why we're promoting the use of BPM Plus on top of already existing uh, lower level type of standards that provides us with the computational data and the data in a cl clinical context. And I'm going to pass it back to John now to talk to us about our particular example for today. Thanks, Denny. So the example we're giving today is for home parental nutrition support. And hit the first slide, please. Uh, now, uh, some of you may not be familiar with parental nutrition, and the parental nutrition is basically uh, nutrition that's given parenterally, which means through a intravascular catheter. The nutrition might be a solution of uh, lipids, proteins, carbohydrates, amino acids, whatever, that are made up in uh, relatively thick and viscous uh, serial solutions uh, that are infused through a central catheter. And that means into one of the major uh, blood uh, major veins. Uh, these uh, solutions are too concentrated to be safely infused peripherally, uh, so a catheter is required. Now, when one uh, talks about nutrition, there's parenteral nutrition, there's enteral nutrition. Enteral nutrition is nutrition that you get through the GI tract. So when you eat, that's enteral nutrition. And parenteral nutrition is used when enteral nutrition is insufficient to meet the needs of the patient. Now, enteral nutrition is always preferable uh, when possible because it's usually safer. Uh, and the logistical issues are less. Uh, but when you need to give uh, meet the nutritional needs of a patient, sometimes you have to go parenterally. Now, parental nutrition may be partial or total. Uh, partial could be some uh, 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 enteral nutrition and some uh, parental nutrition. Sometimes that's all you can get because the uh, intestines are not working at all, in which case you have total parental nutrition or TPN. Uh, next slide, please. So when you have a TPN, what are some of the complications? Well, you've got a big catheter that's uh, going in and it has to be there for a while. And so uh, this leads to a number of complications. One is thrombosis where uh, the uh, a patient gets a clot around the catheter. You can have a central line associated bloodstream infection or CLABSI where uh, the uh, catheter is a portal through which infection uh, can enter the body. Uh, during the insertion of the catheter or adjustments, you can get a pneumothorax where air is introduced into the pleural cavity or mediastinitis uh, where there's inflammation of the mediastinum. Uh, next slide, please. Now, when we talk about those things, uh, they're sometimes discussed in abstraction. And so what we're going to start introducing now is the knowledge entity model. And Danny will give a much uh, uh, clearer uh, definition during the demonstration. 
but this allows us to gather knowledge and represent it in such a way that we can understand what it, what's going on. So a chem model has three major parts. One is the concept map, which is what we're seeing right now. The second is term definitions, and then the third is a rules. Uh, and the first one we had the uh, concept map where relationships were seen between uh, different terms. In the definitions, each of the terms can be defined. And so we have the term, what its explanation is, helpful information like a picture or video, and then how, what it's linked to, uh, and finally, what the sources of information are. So these are just some of the terms or three of the uh, terms in the concept map. And then if we go to the next slide, we have uh, the idea of rules, where if you take a source, you can extract the information in a series of rules that uh, can then be sorted and accumulated, uh, and these can help guide the building of a model. And all of these points come together under uh, a linkage to decision models. If we get the next slide, please. Which shows a decision model uh, for an early warning score. In this case, it's the standardized early warning score of Patterson, uh, which takes a number of inputs and uh, reaches a decision uh, based upon the inputs. Now the inputs in this case are all ones that could be collected by a uh, uh, medical device, except for the uh, neurologic status, which would require an observation. But all these are uh, inputs that have uh, a definition, they have units, uh, they have various features that are needed to be understood by a human to understand uh, not only the input, but also the output. And as we've seen in the lower left, the uh, linkage to a chem model allows each of the uh, terms to be defined, and therefore we know what's going into the model. Uh, one of the problems of uh, using models in uh, healthcare is people are always concerned is, is this explainable? Do I know where the decision comes from? Here you can have, you know exactly what the model is, you can uh, source it all the way back. And to the right, we have a linkage to the uh, rules that were used and how uh, the score is, the output from the score is utilized. And finally, to the far right, we have the references. We can actually link to the papers uh, and the medical evidence that is used to construct this. So all the knowledge you need to understand the score is here. And so that takes you over to you, Danny. Thank you, John. Um, we'll now go into a little bit of, uh, of a demonstration of the elements that John just introduced. Uh, and to do so, uh, we'll go in a tool. Here, the tool are not all that important. What's important is the fact that these kind of models can be created based on open standards that can be interchanged between various tools that know and adhere to these standards. And there are many of those. Uh, so here we are in the uh, knowledge entity modeler uh, where we're looking at the terminology or the control vocabulary that we're using and we're defining here we can provide a definition. Uh, along with that, we can create concept maps. And concept maps are basically diagrams that relate different concepts to one another so that we have an understanding of the concept in context. So here we have basically, if I'm reading this, this, this diagram quickly, we have the standardized early warning score of Patterson. Uh, this arrow with the empty arrowhead means is a, so this warning score is a type of early warning score. And then we can see that this particular warning score monitors various elements or various concepts here, neurological status, uh, percent of oxygen saturation, uh, et cetera. And these detect uh, various situations. And as you can see, this is a, a, a all, all inclusive type of environment. So the definition that we have here in the various term definition uh, are available in the diagram as well. So I can read the definition in context. And on the other direction, any relationship that we do within the various terms are also reflected in the definition to help better understand uh, what's going on. So here you can see that the standardized early warning score of Patterson, and you see these relationships are added to the explanation or the definition. 
so you can see what it monitors and then uh, have access to all this. Now, very similarly, we also can have a series of rules and these rules can be used to further explain how this uh, goes on. And again, the rules are with the definition in there and you can write the rules that constrain or specify how things should get done and uh, uh, how things. So that gives us a very uh, powerful environment uh, to uh, really make sure that we are disambiguating the terms and the concepts we're using. And as an example, uh, in the context of healthcare, we can even go one step further. That is that beyond this information that's already there and the relations, we can also add uh, some coding. So you can see here that for this particular term, which is peripherally inserted central catheter, we're also adding a SNOMED code uh, that is specifying what is meant based on a medical ontology. So we're very, very uh, clear and unambiguous about what we mean by this term and this concept and how we're using it in the context of these models that we're going to create. Now, the same can be done here. And you can see in this example uh, for uh, pneumothorax, not only did we provide a SNOMED code for it, but we also And this particular value set is a collection of ICD-10 codes uh, for pneumothorax. So these are all uh, available within the models for the practitioner and the modeler as they are creating their model. So going to the DMM decision model, we can see here, it's very simple to read, the square box with the little table at the corner, that's a decision, and the oval shape uh, entries here are uh, what we call input data. So this is basically, for this decision, the information that is required. So I see all the different information requirement to make this decision. And here we're reusing these terms from the knowledge entity modeler which provides us with the definition and context of all the terms that we're using. Now, another shape that is there, it's called a, an authority, uh, a, a knowledge source under the authority link. So we can see that this decision is made under the authority, the authority of this knowledge source, which is the early warning score rules. And if I click here, it will open the uh, rules that were used which is this set of rules here that were used for us to create this decision. And in turn, this particular set of rule was based on another knowledge source authority, which is the reference, which provides us with basically our evidence-based kind of uh, healthcare, where we're using particular uh, publication and evidence as the source. So you can see that we go from this publication knowledge, extracting a series of rules and terms and definitions, and then using this to create the logic of a decision. And in this particular case, the decision is a decision table, uh, which is really easy to read. Each column is an input, and each, each row specify a rule. So the first row basically says, for systolic blood pressure under 70, I don't care about all the other elements, you get a score of three. Now, if you're within 70 to 80, don't care about the, the others, I give you a score of two, et cetera, et cetera. And we go through all the various inputs like this, culminating the, uh, uh, the score that is provided on each of the factors that are observed. And the C plus here means that this is a accumulation and addition of the score that are done. So when we create these models, they're really easy to create by subject matter expert, practitioners, uh, and provide the full context. Now we can use this particular decision within the context of a process flow. So here we have a BPMN model with a start event that start by doing the decision, and this is calling this decision model 
that we were looking at before here. And then based on the result on the score, we will take different action and different branch. So let me step through this. It's probably the easiest way for me to actually show you uh, the logic and how this works. So the first thing is we have a patient, we do the score. So this will open, and I'm just using a step-by-step -step animation here so that it's easier to follow, uh, given that an automation runs in a, a millisecond and it's very fast here, we're gonna step through. So it's, we have to make this decision. So if I have a patient with a systolic blood pressure of 117, heart rate of 40, respiratory rate of 14, body temperature of 37, uh, he is reacting to voice and has an oxygen saturation of 97. If I run this, this gives me a standard early warning score of two. I can then go and check how I got that score of two, and it was from all these different rules that fired and the accumulation. So I got zero here, I got one here, I got zero here, I got zero here, and I got one here, and I got zero here, which gives me a total of two. Now, based on this particular total, then this will take the automation into a particular branch. This branch says if you're two or three, you will request the patient uh, call the provider office. So we will send a notification to the patient to call the provider office. And this will initiate a telemedicine session and then we'll follow up with recommendation. Now, as you can think of it, uh, depending on the particular patients and the uh, evaluation and what we see, uh, we'll have a different pattern. So for example, if I run this decision and now I have a patient with a systolic blood pressure of 80, a heart rate of 120, um, a respiratory rate of 30, a body temperature of, let's say, 38.5, uh, reacts to voice and has a 94 percent of oxygen. If I run this, then I get a, a score of eight. And very similarly, I can go and validate which rules give me the score of eight. Now that I have the score of eight, I can see that this is taking me to four or more and it's sending an emergency message to the patient to go to the emergency department uh, to be taken care of immediately. So you can see with this basic step through how we can create, starting from evidence, uh, published evidence, extract rules from that evidence, extract terminology, define this terminology, further disintegrate it with different coding systems and value sets, use this to create a decision model with all the different calculation according to the rules, and then use that decision model within a particular flow workflow context so that we can react appropriately uh, for the current condition. So hopefully this gives you a very good example of everything that is possible. Uh, and I will now pass it back to John uh, for our conclusion. Back to you, John. Oh, you have to switch me over. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thanks, Denny. So uh, what we'd like to do is uh, just give a conclusion of what we've just shown. And we hope that we've demonstrated how you can use uh, uh, telemedicine uh, to help vulnerable uh, populations um, with complications such as CLAPSI. Uh, the use of remote monitoring devices can be combined with early warning scores so that you can help detect uh, uh, problems before their significant clinical deterioration and they can make an interventions while uh, uh, you're in a, a, a good point of patient's uh, course. 
then accumulated data from monitoring devices can be represented in dashboards for trend analysis, which is another feature which can be useful to uh, remote clinicians. We've also demonstrated the, inter, uh, the ability to uh, interlace uh, knowledge entity models uh, with decision and uh, process models uh, to provide disambiguating terms and help explanations. In addition to that, we can provide coding uh, that can be useful when uh, providing uh, the, fire, the final implementation. And our final conclusion is that telemedicine can improve patient care and patient safety. And that wraps it up for, uh, for some questions. Uh, unfortunately, we're, we're right at the edge of our time, so you can see on the screen both John and I email. Uh, we invite you to contact us through email if you have further questions or comments. Uh, those that already had questions into the question streams, we're going to be answering them via email over the next few days. Thank you very much for participating and attending this uh, telemedicine conference. We have a follow on conference on telemedicine uh, in a few weeks. We invite you to go and register to this uh, as we believe this uh, full series is very informative on how to use these different standards in the context of telemedicine. Have a great day. Thank Thanks, you. everyone.